Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome again Jasper Carrot. Thanks very much, thank you. Well, what a coincidence. It's the same audience as last week. <laughs> They're going to cut none, you know, aren't they? <laughs> They're not daft, you know. But can't you move seats or something? <laughs> can you wear a hat? <laughs> That's it. You can show off. You weren't laughing last week. <laughs> That's it. Um... <laughs> right. <clears throat> Show me a home where the buffaloes roam And I'll show you a house full of cow dung <laughs> No, no Don't start clapping, I'll throw fish <laughs> I don't know whether... I'm not too sure where you all come from, but... Have you noticed how local radio is, uh, is taking quite a hold these days? Because, like, a couple of years ago we never used to have any, did we? And uh, now you've got... Uh, well, there's two types of local radio station. There's, uh, there's the BBC ones and there's commercial radio. And uh, in London, it's Capital. Um, in, Pic in Manchester, it's Piccadilly. In Birmingham, it's BRMB. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, we've got some people from BRMB. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I, don't know, I don't know what it stands for, BRMB. It, um, I think it's Brum Radio and they forgot the U. <laughs> And it's strange, it's, um, it's very funny. I mean, I think any, any, uh, anything like that in its embryonic state is, is amusing, and um, I think the adverts are, are very funny. And uh, put a dab of brew cream on your stairs and watch your granny bounce. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what I think. Uh, what I think is funny is that, I mean, uh, commercial radio, local commercial radio, I mean, a lot of local firms use it for advertising, but, I mean, a really good quality advert costs a lot of money, you know, a few hundred quid. I mean, I mean the local butcher's not going to pay out 200 quid to have an advert made, is it? I mean, he gets his son with his woolly cassette out from under the bed and, you know, knocks one out for his old man. And uh, you hear things on BRMB like, Good to add, Dad, for your chops! <laughs> I used to work for uh, I used to work for Radio Birmingham at one stage. I used to run a, a folk program there, and um, it was interesting, really, because the, they wanted to do this folk program and they called me in to do the comparing. You see, and I said, "What are you going to call it?" And they said, "Oh, been really thinking about it. Oh, got this super name. It sums up the whole of the folk music movement and the effect of the acoustic guitar upon the music." And they called it Folk Club. <laughs> Snappy, huh? huh? <laughs> I thought, oh, great. And um, it was a real weird show, because, like, they advertised it as it was the first Tuesday in the month, every four weeks. But <laughs> <laughs> like, when they had this one month with five Tuesdays, they hadn't got a clue. <laughs> they played half the show on the... Uh, and then the rest of it on the following Tuesday, and, um, and then it got lost, and then no-one could keep up the sequence, and it just got haywire, and... There was a game at Radio Birmingham saying, Guess when Folk Club is on? <laughs> the Radio Times one, they got it right twice in about 18 months. <laughs> but I, used to, I had to pass a medical. Um, yes, to, to do... To, um... uh, <laughs> I'd only ever had one medical in my life before. And that was at school. And you know how thorough a school medical is. Eh? They get through about 800 kids in half an hour. Okay? <laughs> You'd run through the gym with your tongue out. <laughs> you fall over, you're blind. <laughs> and I had to go and see this doctor. And he was like an old guy. And, um, and, he, and I, I came in and he said, uh, Right, Mr. Kellett. Going to do, to do um, all these tests here, and uh, and I was doing all the you doing all the chopping of the leg bits and and coughing and <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that. I've got to admit it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Get it where you can. 
<laughs> Reading all these silly card things, you know, blix a tick, mix, mix, mix. Um, and I went through it like a dose of sorts, no problem, the whole, the whole test, until right at the end, he said, uh, he said, uh, right, Mr. Kelly, he said, I, I'm, I'm going to test your water now. <laughs> it's a pun. <laughs> said, I'm going to do a urine test. <laughs> Terrible word, isn't it? Test. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do I do? He said, well, um, he said, I, I want a sample of your water. Said, Where? <laughs> No, it's an old joke, but really, truth is, he did. He said, like, I, I want it in the beaker on the shelf there. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, you know. And I thought he was playing me along, you see. And I said, well, you know, I mean, if you can get me a stool, I'll be all right. <laughs> so he hands me this beaker down. And it was a bit unfortunate, really, because I was having this medical, and it was just after the dinner hour. And uh, I'd been drinking with a few friends, you know, that about six pints of brown and mild, you know. And, uh, well, he should have had a bigger beaker, I mean. <laughs> when you start, you can't suddenly stop, can you? Can you? <laughs> and it was all going all over. <laughs> my, my bloody carpet! <laughs> And he gets this litmus paper and starts stirring it round. And I said, wouldn't you like a spoon? <laughs> Don't be silly. I said, wait, he said, it's all right. He said, it'll come out blue. <laughs> and it was bright orange. <laughs> he says, good heavens, that can't be right. Pass some more. <laughs> you got on the fountain or something. Right? You can't double take just like that. Can you look? And um, I was sort of like thinking about waterfalls and a stream. <laughs> Oh, come on. I said, I can't help it. I can't help it. He said, here, have, have some water. I said, mm, here, have the bloody jug. <laughs> Go and take a walk around the ground. So I'm walking around all these great big industrial grounds, this great big jug of water, and all the girls are waving from the windows. Yo, no! What are you doing? <laughs> You'd never believe it. <laughs> and he tested it again, and it was orange, you see. And he said, good, he said, I think we've got sugar in the water. I said, that's easy. It could be. It'll stop you drinking. <laughs> it's serious. So um, he sent me to uh, hospital. I had to go to the hospital the next day and have a blood test, you see. And he said, I want you to go to the hospital and have a blood test, he said. And uh, he said, what I want you to do as well is to take a sample of your water with you. I said, right. So I woke up the next day and I was looking around for a container. <laughs> I hadn't got a clue, really. I mean, when I was, um, I got a Titan Lyle bag. <laughs> Well, that's a bit useless. <laughs> um, and in the end, I found um, a scotch bottle. One of those square ones with the crooked label. And I filled that up, I okay. think. And um, I put it in a, in a brown paper parcel and went on the bus to the hospital. And I got off the bus and I walked up to the gate with my card and showed the commissioner. And I suddenly realised I'd left the parcel. <laughs> On the bus going down the road. And I thought, oh, God, no. You know, like the biggest loser of all time is going to find that, aren't they? <laughs> Take it to his mates. Who's for Scotch? Oh, me, please, Frank. <laughs> Cheers, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Frank. <laughs> Tastes just like piss, doesn't it? <laughs> and, uh, I've never had it back, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and funny enough, there's a, there's a sequel to it as well, because I, got, I finally went back home. I had to go back home again and go the next day. And... Uh, the only thing I could find was a giant disinfectant bottle, an immense thing. So I like, oh, it was only about that. Pull them. So anyway, I took it, you know, and like, put it in a bag and clutched it. And I thought, and I got off and went to the hospital. And they were doing these blood tests. Because it was an emergency blood test. I was in the antenatal clinic. Because that's where they do blood tests all the time. So they sent me to the antenatal clinic. And so and I breezed into this sort of room. And there's all these pregnant women sitting in 
<laughs> like there's me with me parcel in the <laughs> Morning. Mm -hmm. And the nurse came out, you know, and she was going, uh, Mrs. Cartwright? Yeah. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mrs. Carrot? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I'm awfully sorry. Yeah, you're here for a blood test? Mm-hmm, yes. Bought your sample? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give it to the nurse, please. Mm -hmm. We don't want the bag. Great big giant disinfectant. <laughs> and these pregnant women went, Whoa! <laughs> all over the place. Like, Four of them were in labour when I left. <laughs> Again, about this is local radio. This is a true, true story. I, uh, I went uh, a while ago. I had a certain success with a single record, and it was a strange record because um, a lot of people think that the record was uh, sold on a thing called Funky Moped, which is not strictly true. It hardly sold a light on, on Funky Moped. You had to turn it over, and the B side sold the record, and it was a thing called Magic Roundabout. Right. <laughs> No, 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 please, no, no. no. <laughs> and uh, the trouble was, Magic Roundabout itself was banned from the radio, for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, but at the time, when, when the record first came out, when the, the single first came out, it was the first record I ever made. And the record company uh, obviously have to promote singles. And they have a promotions man, you see. And they said to this guy, um, You've got this bloke coming down from Birmingham called Jasper Carrot. And he's made this new single called Funky Moped. He's getting really excited, you know. Okay. <laughs> Last week Elton John, this week it's Jasper Carrot. <laughs> Great, yeah. So, like, you know, basically all I've got to do is take him around the local radio stations and plug the single, because that's how you get singles plugged, is it? Particularly with the local station. There. So, we went trolling off down the south coast, and... Um, We'd done a couple of stations, and then we went to this one station, and I won't tell you where it was, but it was a BBC one. And uh, local radio is very short start as well. Uh, I thought I'd point that out. Like the bloke who does the epilogue does the sport. Uh, <laughs> you know, cleans up after everybody's gone. And, <laughs> and this one bloke also did the housewife show in the afternoon. Um, and it's live, out on the air, you know, and, like, and, and they see dozens of people with new singles every day. I mean, it's nothing new, you see. And it gets a bit like a conveyor belt, so, like, this promotions rep drags me into this station. I sit down there, and, like, and the bloke's on the air gabbling away. And he said, well, we just had a, a visitor into the studio, and we'll be talking to him as soon as this next record finishes, which is uh, Gracie Field singing um, Twist and Shout. <laughs> he said, uh, ah, good afternoon. He said, and uh, who are you? And the promotions rep said, uh, it's Jasper Carrot. Because I hadn't learned to talk properly by then. <laughs> <laughs> he said, right, Jasper, he said, um, where are you from? I said, Birmingham. He said, oh, Birmingham, eh? Well, it always rains. Ha, 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 ha. Yes. Hmm. He said, right, we're going uh, live onto the air, OK? Right, right. Right, and we have in the studio um, <coughs> Jasper Carrot, um, a gentleman who's come all the way from Birmingham, uh, where it always rains. Ha, 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 ha. Oh yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, what brings you to what brings you to the uh, to the area, Jasper? And I said, well, uh, you can you never admit that you're plugging your single. That's the one thing you must never admit. And I said, well, I'm just opening up a, an army and navy stores. <laughs> said, really? Yes. And um, and he went into this deep, involved conversation, like you know, how tall are you, and what's your granny's name? And he said, uh, have you got any records out at all, Jasper? And I said, well, it's <laughs> what a coincidence. Um, I've just released this new single. He said, oh, he said, have, you, have you got one with you? <laughs> I've got about 10,000. <laughs> so I gave it to him. He said, right. He said, uh, is this the first time in the area? I said, it is indeed. He said, right, the first time in the area has Jasper Carrot singing Funny Moped. <laughs> I said, no, it's, it's Funky Moped. He said, what? I said, it's called Funky Moped. Said, is it? What is it? <laughs> 
Yeah, sorry, yes. So they can say, no, that's Funky Moped by Jasper Carrot. Well, Jasper, blah, 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 blah. And some more chat. And um, he said, well, thank you very much for calling into the studios, Jasper. Wonderful to see you. Uh, all the success with the single. He said, and just before you go, we'll play the B-side of your latest single. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried to stop him. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't have played it. <laughs> Too late, it was on. And what amused me more than anything was that there's, there's a lead-up to the record. It's, it's not a song, it's just a sketch of Magic Rain. And I lead in by saying, well, I pinched it from the BBC, and, that, um, and how everybody at the BBC talks like that all the time. <laughs> and uh, he listened to that, he went, yeah. <laughs> very confident, he said, do you know, Jasper, he said, it's so true. Everybody around here talks like that all the time. <laughs> I couldn't get me breath. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, he started listening to this single, you know, and he was chuckling away. <laughs> Most amusing. <laughs> yes, very. <laughs> very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I, uh, um, uh, there aren't any four letter words in this, are there? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Because when he came to piss off, he fell out of his chair. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it wasn't me, I didn't know anything about it. I thought you said there was no four-letter words. I said, well, there are. He said, what about that? <laughs> B-I-Z. <laughs> anyway, why we spell it in Birmingham. <laughs> anyway, it's always bloody raining there, isn't it? <laughs> At school, I like talking about school days. Basically because I was a complete non-entity of school. I went through the whole of my school days completely unrecognised. <laughs> the only time I ever had my name in the school magazine was when, like, they print all the first formers' names in the school magazine. <laughs> that is it. That is it. And I'm always interested in asking people, like, how, how um, we used to call it fagging or fagging. It's when the, when the first formers turn up and, like, you know, you do the most abysmal things to them, don't you, really? Yeah, do you? <laughs> really? Oh, we were abysmal. Really abysmal. We used to have this thing in our school called the blue goldfish. And we used to say to the, to the first one, Hello! How are you? Fine. Have you seen the blue goldfish? <coughs> no! <laughs> it's over here. And we used to take him into the bog, you see. <laughs> we used to point inside the lavatory pan going, The blue goldfish is in there. They go, Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great wheeze, that <laughs> Actually, I never caught on to it. And I was in the fifth form, and the first form was showing me the blue gold. <laughs> I haven't seen it in five years, you know, really? <laughs> and uh, my best subject at school was French. I actually took the GCE uh, mock O level in French. <laughs> and got 17%. <laughs> they were thrilled at this score, because like, that was the highest mark anyone had ever got in French. <laughs> and, um, so they were really keen, because like, I mean, they, they wanted the first pass in O-level in French, for the first pass in O-level full stop for the school. <laughs> they, they, they put this, uh, this French teacher onto me, they said, like, you know, give him special tuition, special coaching. And he was a bit weird, very odd. And he gave me all these books to read which I couldn't make head and a tail of at the time. I mean, I think I'd appreciate them now. At the time, I hadn't got a clue what it was about. You know? and, um, and in about six months' time, I took the GCE proper. And I hadn't really been, I hadn't really been sort of taught properly, I don't think, because I was totally unexpected for the exam. Like, I mean, when you have a GCE exam, right, you have to sit in your desk, right, and you're on your own, right? They split you up from your mate, don't they? Well, that was half the knowledge gone for a start. <laughs> I mean, I used to learn the linguist and he used to learn the French. We used to put them together. And I sort of sat there and I thought, oh, this is a bit odd. And they hand you brown paper envelopes, which you can't open till the bloke at the front, the teacher with the stopwatch, says, Allez! <laughs> so he got up there with the stopwatch and he said, Allez! And everybody started ripping open the paper envelopes to look at the exam papers, so, except me. Because I hadn't got a clue what he was on about. Right? <laughs> And I looked around, I thought, blimey, everybody's cheating. <laughs> I thought, I'll cheat as well. So I opened up my brown paper envelope and I got it out. And the whole exam paper was in French. <coughs> and I thought, just my luck, isn't it, eh? Just my luck. Like, it would happen to me. Would happen? Like, obviously, my counterpart in Paris has got the English paper. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I walked up to the bloke at the front. I said, can you translate all this, please? <laughs> and he told me to go away. <laughs> In French. <laughs> I understood what he meant, because I'd been reading these books he'd been giving me. And... Uh, I just sort of sat there for four hours twiddling my thumbs and just for something to do, I wrote down 93 verses of the French Eskimo Nell. <laughs> it's a party piece of mine, you know. And I handed that in for the exam. I couldn't think of anything else to do. And uh, whoever the examiner was who marked it had a sense of humour because he gave me 30% <laughs> and an invitation to a French stag evening. <laughs> the setting here is French, isn't it? Have you noticed how the setting's very French? <laughs> no, really, no, 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 no. Have you seen it? You can't see this, can you, from here? Can, can you... I mean, what is that? <laughs> if you've got a gold dog, you're in, aren't you? <laughs> it's like something from Monty Python, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that a silly programme, Monty Python? Yeah. I've, I've never been able to understand that. They go on and on and on about inane situations that can never happen in a million years. Frankly, I'm amazed anybody watches it at all, particularly when there's programmes like Opportunity Knox and Emma Dale Farm you can get into. <laughs> Why spend time on futile humour shows that simply glorify the macabre and mentally disturbed? You'd have to be a necrophiliac to watch some of the programmes I see. Yes? <laughs> Who can really laugh at the idea of cutting the fur and front legs off a badger, sewing feathers on his chest, a beak on his nose and passing him off as a budgerie guard? <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and did you see that? Really silly football match between the London gynaecologist and the Long John Silver Impersonation Society. Well, I knew I was going to win before they even started. Particularly when the Long John Silver Impersonation Society get falling off the parrots and squashing the crutches in the fence. <laughs> but what really gets me is that greasy little Dago, Eric Idle, the one who keeps going nudge, nudge, wink, wink, know what I mean, know what I mean, break away, break away. Oh, I've never liked him since the first days I set eyes on him. And the way he took the mickey of that poor bloke on the park bench, asking his, if his wife goes, know what I mean, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, does she pose for photos in the news? Absolutely disgusted. It's amazing the BBC censorship panel didn't do something about that. It's amazing that lovely Mrs Mary Whitehouse didn't do something about it. Dude. That's a bluey green blesser. <laughs> It's all over the place for no apparent reason. It's sickening the way the emphasis is always on violence with blood and guts and gore. The way they have people's eyeballs popping out the sockets, <laughs> dangling down with mucus stripping off the mangled membrane. <laughs> the soggy ends of limbs bust round bare buttocks with gay abandon. The insidious descriptions of excruciating pain as they nail someone's head to the dining room floor. <laughs> oh, I can hardly bear to talk about it. <laughs> Eating pauses a rat pile, crunchy frog, dairy milk, chocolates. Who writes that sort of stuff? Who watches it? My next door neighbour, that's who watches it. He's only got half a head, they found him in the middle of the M6 on Sunday practicing his silly walks. <laughs> I said you want to write up and try and get on the program. They'd love you, they would blow me. They'd probably blow you to bits in the first minute. Or have you interviewing a strawberry flan asking him whether he's doing a conservative or something. And all he did was smile, lift up his braces, put handkerchief on his head and go, Ooh! And he still watches the program. Not that it's as good as it was, is it? Well, not that I watch it very much, of course. Well, not very often anyway. Well, once or twice this month. <laughs> And it starts going on and on and on about people like me who like nothing more than a few days in Mallorca, sipping tea like mum makes, wanting his draft red ballot, being on the beach, squirting Timothy White sunscreen, all over me, sweating, sweating, chewing his breath, because I only did it on the first day, being hurt in the head. <laughs> Where's the floor manager? Another thing, there's no paper in the box. <laughs>